two seconds left. Roll to Abdul Hamid, the game former like, walk on. Won a game against Concordia just like that. He wins he it. Ready? Let's do it. All right. Yo, what's up, everyone? Welcome into season two, episode one of Around the Association, presented by The Cross House. Season one is officially a wrap. Uh, we did 20 episodes, nice round number. Um, I thought with the NBA season right around the corner, this felt like the right time to kind of close the book on season one and start new with season two. And uh, as you can tell, we are back live in person here in LA. Um, I enjoyed doing the video components so much on episode 20 that I decided to stick with it. I'm gonna try my best to keep it rolling as long as possible. Um, and I'm stoked to be back with you guys for season two and got an incredible list of guests lined up. Uh, our first one here today is a bit special, a bit of a white whale, if you will. Uh, he's been eluding us for, for a while now, but we probably, we finally got him on and in person. Um, in terms of an introduction, I'm not quite sure where to begin. Uh, I mean, I thought I got catfished by, by, can I call you Christian? We call you Basing Baller only, I man. mean, I go by either. All right, man, all right, cool. So I, got, I thought I got catfished. So Christian and I have been friends uh, and collaborators, co-workers, and everything for like 10 years, but we've never Stop. met each other in person. We went to the same high school. Uh, we both hooped, obviously. Uh, yep. I heard so much about, you know, Christian a few years younger than me. He's like, man, this up-and-coming kid, he's, he's doing all these things and entrepreneurship and all that. You got to meet him. And I wasn't sure if I was going to look up and get jumped in an alley finally, <laughs> man, but live and in person, dude, it's great to meet you. It's been yes, great sir. hanging out in LA for a bit. Yes, sir. What's it been like uh, to be back in LA? You enjoying it? It's been good, man. It's a it's a grind. So um, we were out here on business. So we had some meetings in San Diego. Drove up from San Diego. Yep, yep. Did some stuff at UCLA. Got to link up with the with the old basketball ops guys and and the athletic directors and all that stuff. That was a good time. Absolutely. Uh, met some folks at Anderson School of Business. Drove to Malibu. My man Christian's got the hookup with a great restaurant in Malibu. <laughs> then went to Pasadena. Uh, chilled with some folks. It was crazy because you asked me how is it being back in LA. Yeah. There are two things that stood out. One is like these freeways are enormous and it's insane. <laughs> but two, uh -huh. I remember, so I I got, we can dive into some storytelling here. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Recruited, I was a recruited walk on to UCLA. So I was mm -hmm. more of a mid major type kid coming out of school. Mm -hmm. You can tell me that, but that's who was recruiting me. <laughs> and so um, we can talk to, how my Davidson officer offered. Let's hear about goal. that. Like, yeah. It's a little bit of a sore subject still. But <laughs> so I'll tell you, I was um, playing in high school, school called MICDS. Uh, Shout out Scott Small. Shout out St. Louis Country yeah, Day. There you go, man. So I um, was playing there, smaller school, yeah. and um, and started getting recruited by uh, Davidson College. Mm -hmm. I got put on to Davidson because I went to five star. Mm -hmm. I went to Five Star. I went to, I think it was like their guards camp or something like that at the time. And it's funny because I felt I was under recruited. Wasn't getting a lot of action and all that. Went to Five Star. Nobody had any idea who, who I was. I was trying to make a name and I played extremely well. Worked hard. Mm -hmm. Garf, like, he really connected the dots with a lot of people there to help get some eyes on me because I was playing well. Mm -hmm. It's a guy named, uh, Coach uh, Konchowski, he actually just passed away. You should look him up. Uh, it's Tom Konchowski. Um, brilliant guy in the basketball world. Best memory I've ever, uh, of anyone I ever met in uh -huh. the basketball world. Knew every player. He can remember, recount thousands of, of prep players and all that. Uh -huh. Anyway, so go up there, play well, and, and they say, hey, they talked to Coach McKillop and said, hey, you should recruit this kid. They has got a chance, knew what they were looking for. Yeah. So they had tried to pull this dude named Steph Curry. Steph Curry, from what I understand, he was going to Virginia Tech, maybe as a recruited walk-on or something. His dad's footsteps, yeah, right? and I think he like verbal there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm getting recruited by Coach Kozmowski, I believe, at the time, mm -hmm. and feeling great. Smaller school, great environment, great school. I had heard great things about Coach McKillop. Legendary, and, yeah, legendary coach just retired. Uh, yeah. And uh, I didn't know he just retired. Just retired? Just retired, yeah. Really? You know, I, I, I called him not too long ago. But really? I, we'll, get to, we'll get to that. So, um, so we're doing, doing this thing. Things are going well. I'm getting recruited. He's going to come, and they're going to make an offer, do an in-home visit. He was an old-school guy, you know, want to meet in person and all that stuff. Sure. It's great. And then all of a sudden, it's ripped because this dude named Steph Curry decided – 
to pick up this offer um, that was still there and they had a good, a long standing relationship. So I don't know Steph at all, but Steph, you owe me some money, bro. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of money. And, and, and yeah, I mean, a little just bit a of piece, money. man. Yeah, so that was where I was going with. I didn't know you were that close to actually going. To oh, it was it was a, I, so I had a couple of things in the Ivy League, in the Ivy League. So See, got an I've offer heard, from there. You mentioned another story about Harvard. Somebody else stealing, yeah, your, stealing your scholarship. Well, he didn't steal it. I actually decided not to go because I wanted to go to the show to come to UCLA. Yeah, and uh, and then Jeremy Lin went there. Heard right? of him? And he's you know he amazing guy. We actually played pickup together. He has some runs in the Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I don't know him that well, but he was working with another academy or whatever. So we went up and played, and it was kind of funny because yeah. I played against some of these guys a couple times, and, and you know, still got a little chip on my shoulder. I'm old oh, now, man, but yeah. Um, but yeah. So it was gonna be Davis, and that was a that was where I wanted to go. Really, right? And then Harvard, I went on a visit. Yeah, great experience, but I wanted to. So when all this kind of happened. I had actually gone to UCLA on, they were recruiting a kid named Alex Tyus. So mm-hmm. Alex went on to Florida, he played in Europe a long time. He didn't stick in the, in the league, I think he might have played, he might have went to camp or something like that and yeah. had a chance. He had a great college career. Though. Yeah, he went to Florida, we won't talk about that, <laughs> it hurts. But we went to the same middle school and all that. He's a St. Louis guy. Yeah, I didn't know. You told me years later Bro, he that broke he was the at MICS. In, he broke the backboard in like seventh in grade. In the MAC. No, it was in the uh, oh the South Gym. The South Gym. Yeah, yeah dude, I had was, no idea. He we was throwing lobs and stuff like that. Yeah, he cracked the whole. He shacked the backboard in seventh grade. That's wild. That yeah. would have been a crazy. That would have been legendary. Am I yeah, We had some good. We had some. We had some good. Some good players. Man. Yeah. And there was another kid who ended up transferring. There were some. There were some good players, man. Damn. Yeah. So you came out to a camp at UCLA, right? Yeah, in so, the summertime. So Alex, they were recruiting Alex, a guy named Kerry Keating. Um, it's an assistant coach. Coach Keating actually was an advisor to, to my company before we sold it. He's We've kept in touch. He's mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. But he could sell water to a well, man. Like, <laughs> coaches, the, I think Coach got his start, man, like before Synergy. So any of the hoop fans that know like Synergy and some of the video tools and all that. Yeah. He was like hustling some like, like wired up DVD video systems to record games before people started recording games. Like, yeah. He's the old school basketball tech guy. Yeah. Anyway, sit down. He says, "Hey, you have opportunity to play. Have the opportunity to, um, you know, to come here, earn a scholarship, and all that. After first year, we don't have scholarships for this year, but they were recruiting, recruiting Alex Ty. So I come out. Alex says, "Yo, can my boy come with me?" And ask them. They say, "Sure." Obviously, they're recruiting him. Yeah. Come down and uh, and I played really well. Yeah. Because I thought. Coach Holland was Doug Erickson. Doug Erickson, the director of basketball <laughs> operations, which I didn't know anything about. I thought he was the camp guy. Yeah. So I was playing free. I was like, oh, it's the camp guy. You know what I mean? But it was Ben Holland. So he had people, he had these Blessing like, in disguise. That was great, man. Really? Yeah, it's like we were playing three on three, four on four, five on five. Yeah. yeah some of the current players, you know, Darren DC was there and, mm-hmm. and Farmar was there and you know, it was a guy named Ryan Wright, Luke Bamute. So he had a lot yeah, of the guys, sure. freshmen, sophomores mostly, okay. come down and, and do their thing, right? Yeah. And then he called up volunteers. And I hopped up yeah. and played really well. And that's when he was like, Hey, I want you know, I want you to I want you to come here. Wow. Right? Started getting recruited by uh, Coach Keating and then that was when they beat Gonzaga in that what was that? Elite Eight or Sweet Six. The iconic game where Adam Morrison was yeah, on the court crying. Yeah, exactly. And, and Aaron picked him up and all that. Luke yeah. had the tip. And then Darren got in all, all yep. that stuff, man. Finished the layup and everything. Yeah. Whatever that was, I, I remember Coach Holland called me. I was watching that game in my girlfriend in high school's like basement, like riveted, right? Yeah. And uh, watching that game, and Coach Holland called. Because I was like, I wanted to go to the show, but it was also I wanted a scholarship, you know? Yeah. He called me f- from the locker room. I don't know. I, he was allowed to do Wait, that. Wait, what? Yeah, it was like, it was, this, they, they do that. I don't be careful of the rules. So if I say something stupid, you know, <laughs> cut, cut it out. But whatever. It was a lot of recruiting time. I don't know. But whatever. He called me and he was like, we just won this game. This is the kind of thing I want you to be a part of. This is what we bring whoa, to UCLA. Whoa, whoa. And I was like, let's go. It was done. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, he was calling a preferred walk-on from the locker room after his Sweet 16? Here's the thing about Coach Holland, man. Is like he he knew what it took to build a team. 
right? Yeah. And the team means that you need depth, you need players, you need all of that. Yeah. And so, nah, he was building the – I mean, we were stacked. And so, yeah, oh, exactly. Man. That's wild. Yeah. So that, and that makes you feel good, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, you could oh. not go there after that. Oh, man, I was trying to – like, oh, I'm about to be in the Final <laughs> Four, you know? I'm about to get 25, 30 minutes a game. I'm yeah. about to be in the Final <laughs> Four. I might have been a youthful – Pipe dream, you yeah. know, but yeah. So, so you commit to UCLA mm. uh, as preferred walk on, mm-hmm. right? And so then I earned the scholarship because Russ took the scholarship. You did earn a scholarship. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I earned my scholarships the rest of the way, but oh, Russ took that. the scholarship freshman year. Yeah, so that was going to be my That's segue. What I'm saying, man, these so, dudes owe me some money, man. That was going to be my segue <laughs> is uh, your freshman class, oh, so 06, coming in the fall of 06 at mm-hmm. UCLA was a loaded freshman class. Who was in that class? So, I mean, Russell wasn't the big name because I think he had one or two scholarships. I don't know where. You probably might know better than I was like Murray State or Wichita State or something like that. Yeah, it was a small – Weber State maybe. Yeah, I, th- I feel like it was Wichita State. It might have been Wichita. Or I've heard stories that like Coach Holland – it was because Jordan Farmar uh, ended up going to the league a year mm-hmm. early, right? And so I've heard stories that uh, – the Lusinger high school coach uh, had to call Ben Holland and like vouch for Russ because the Farmar scholarship opened up. Right. Is that- I don't I don't know about that, but okay. I know he was under recruited. I yeah. know he weighed about fifteen pounds, <laughs> <laughs> and he came in. But like, is the same why not mentality is yeah. like how that dude thought all the time. Yeah. But Coach Keating to me was the one he, from what I know, like Coach Keating was a talent identifier. Okay. And the thing, if you look at the guys they recruited, Darren Collison was not a highly, highly recruited player. Russell no. Westbrook was not highly, highly recruited. Not at all. You know, and then you look at, at that time, it was a dude, Luke Mbamute, and then another guy, Alfred Aboya. Yeah. Those guys were players, but they weren't five stars from what I remember. Oh, no. And yeah. they, so they found, it wasn't about just fit in terms of play style. He found competitive, good people mm-hmm. that were ready to go. And those practices, yeah. because of that, were dog fights. And oh, I can imagine. Literally, like it was in your like toughness. Yeah, you know, same like oh, I yeah. had the same mentality. Aaron Aflalo, highly recruited. Aaron Aflalo was a, was a fighter, right? About his business, and he was just a competitor. Compton. So they recruited this, <laughs> and they recruited the right kind of guys. Now, Aaron was from like way out in the country in Compton, man. Oh, was he? <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. You guys overlapped for one year. His senior year is your freshman year, right? He, yeah. Uh, or no, he, he left early. He left after three. Okay. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was his. That was his. Uh, yeah, we overlap. So I, th- I mean, I can name all the guys, but and all and some of the players who I feel like like Josh Ship was a savage. He was one of my favorite players growing up. People don't Josh understand Shipp. how good that dude was. Like He's incredible. You got to remember, he had two hip surgeries. One of them was a labrum. Mm. Right. That's a that can be a death sentence. Yeah, like Josh was a like he was a savage. And he, he ended could up get almost like two thousand career points at UCLA. I, I don't know how many he ended up with, man, but he, he was, was a bucket. bucket. And I and I mean, he could get off the ground. He was aggressive. He could go. And oh, if you yeah. look at his highlights, you should look at his highlights in yeah. Turkey. His okay. first year, I forget what team he played for. It's a smaller team, but look at those highlights, and you'd be like, oh my goodness, it was yeah. crazy. And then he kept playing, and he played and got a toss in some big places, but. But Ship is a Ship was a killer. Yeah. You know? But all those guys were so the practices. This is why it's not about like the five star class to me. It's about you got identified talent and those guys. You're looking at you're looking at upside in a different way than other people are looking yeah. at. It. What they were looking at was upside because of like competitive instinct, character. Yeah. In addition to all the athletic qualities and, and mm-hmm. all that stuff, and so all of those guys could compete. Well, that's that's funny you mentioned because it, it was the 09 class that was like on the cover of Sports Illustrated number one class that was like Malcolm Lee wasn't it Drew Holiday? It, it might have been the, probably 08, but 08. Ma- Malcolm, Drew Holiday, Jeremy Anderson, Bobo Morgan, and yeah, Drew Gordon. But it was like that class was the one that was like so highly touted and so yeah. heralded, and then it ended up honestly not being as good as yeah. the, the previous couple of classes like your class that yeah. wasn't as highly touted those guys were good though man and that's what were, I'm saying was, like they was, were quality guys they were quality guys and it didn't all fit together right for a million reasons I also think the game was starting to change at that point mm. the way that you have you know even like 
the communication to players. It was kind of the like shift in the generations a little bit. Yeah. But like Drew Holiday, the best player. I don't know who you said the other day when we went to dinner. It was like, oh, it's the best player I ever saw in college. You were talking about Lonzo. Alonzo, Drew, yeah. Yeah, you were talking about Alonzo Ball. Drew Holiday was the best player at that age, obviously still a magnificent player, that yeah. I had ever seen. He was doing stuff that was unimaginable to me. Right, the poise that he had and the body control that he had mm-hmm. was absolutely incredible. Uh, an incredible human being. The whole family was like yeah. great people. Yeah. And little Aaron Holiday, little Aaron Holiday, yeah. had to be like in sixth, seventh grade, and he would come around, little gym rat, hooping, and I was like, that dude's going to be good too. And all three of them made the league. Yeah, all, all three of them could play. And all three of them were good people, whole family, right? Oh, yeah. Malcolm Lee. And all Malcolm the dancing and shaking and like the movement, like Mal's a player, Jeremy could play. And, and, and Drew Gordon, like it all didn't work out, right? You had transfers and all that stuff. Yeah. But all those guys were, they could, they could really play the game. And I, I, I think part of it was that from a maturity standpoint, it didn't all get put together fast enough. Gotcha. You know? Um, but yeah, like Jeremy had a, I don't know, eight or nine year career playing oh, yeah. professionally. Drew has had a great career playing professionally. Incredible career. And uh, yeah, so those are those are fun times. But the but the best days were obviously kind of kind of early, and we had a really solid class, and that's probably where the strongest relationships were. Oh yeah. So you come in your freshman year, freshman sophomore year, you go to Final Fours, back yeah. to back years. That was part of the the. The three straight Final Four they, years, you got the latter two of those. Yeah, they went to one before. Florida beat them. Then they beat us. And yep. then it was D. Rose and them beat us. Yep. I think it was Atlanta and San Antonio. Yeah. Um, and obviously Kevin and Russ left after that. We had great runs. James Keefe, Western James Kentucky, Keefe. has a game to remember, man. That's he's right. Still, he's still, tell you, he's still, still talks about he had a he had a, a, a tip dunk or something like that in that game. He still talks. He about had eighteen it. and twelve in that game yeah, too. If my memory serves me right. You know what, James? I don't think people, everybody. So all the all the listeners, your audience probably don't know all of these guys, right? Especially because you're a college basketball freak. I'm a UCLA, a UCLA guy. Not, yeah, but, but I grew I, up with all those teams. It's funny, like everybody talks about. Okay, you know who's the greatest player? And we have all these debates. Yeah. Right. To me, the amount of randomness and luck that it takes for those things to happen is incredible, yeah. right? So a guy like James Keefe, that shoulder injury mm-hmm. really changed. I remember, I think it was sophomore going on to junior year, I believe, in the men's gym. Mm-hmm. i never seen, because James likes basketball, mm-hmm. but James, James <laughs> likes surfing, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that summer, dude was flying up and down the court dunking, playing, and it, it might have been that summer before Josh got hurt too. He was flying, and you saw these guys that were on the precipice, but then you have you have an injury, mm-hmm. and that's it, right? Yeah. So you talk about the greatest. You talk about, oh, yeah, how many championships you get? Well, yeah, I mean, if Kevin Love doesn't hurt his, what was it, his shoulder? If Kyrie doesn't hurt his knee, yeah. you know, if so-and-so – if Kawhi doesn't roll an ankle, you remember all these moments, mm-hmm. it changes everything. So you want to sit and have this discussion about the amount of randomness. So in yeah. Bayesian Baller here, right, R, R squared, right? It's like the amount of very variation that can be explained, right? It's the yeah. amount of the thing that can be explained by this model. And yeah. it can be bigger, it can be small. Yeah. And so there's a ton of randomness in here to have people sitting here talking about like all these debates and all that like I don't know oh yeah to have that much success as a team you gotta have things break just and the as, right way and as an individual and right? as an individual too we're not talking about Penny Hardaway right now when you're talking about the greatest of all time debate or yep. Grant Hill yep. or or lots of others you know yeah. even Magic kind of falls out of that debate frequently but Magic had years left you mm-hmm. know so I don't know I, I have you know my thesis we were talking so uh, met a dude named Horace today, runs something called The District up in Chatsworth. Mm-hmm. Awesome community-based basketball facility, but they also got a barber shop. They do content. Mm-hmm. All this really, really cool stuff. And Horace and I were talking. He played overseas, went the NAIA route, and then played overseas, played in the G League and all this. Mm-hmm. Bottom 150, 200 in the NBA yep. can completely be replaced by the top 500 guys uh, playing internationally. Yep. It's thin, right? Now, 
LeBron is is LeBron. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of guys that is a there, there are thin margins there, and, and how it happens, the connections or the randomness, the luck, the ankle not rolling, all yeah. that stuff matters. Well, so I want to talk about so Russ in particular mm-hmm. because he talking about like making it to the league and how hard it is and how everything has to break the right way. Russ came in as totally unheralded, like we touched on. So what was it that changed that summer between freshman year and sophomore year for Russ, for him to make that leap and then go from averaging less than 10 minutes a game off the bench to the number four pick in the draft? Yeah, honestly, I think it was physical development because Russell could, it was even funny, after he, uh, after he left school, people were, saying, you know, oh, he can't play point guard and all this kind of thing, and he can't pass. Russell mm-hmm. could always pass. Russell was always a playmaker. Now, you could mm-hmm. criticize him now and say, yeah, he's not the best passer in the NBA. Like, okay, fine, <laughs> right? But he's, yeah. he is an NBA point guard, an NBA playmaker. The amount of pressure that he puts on defense is still incredible. Mm-hmm. And he could, he could always pass the ball. Mm-hmm. And so um, even things like, you know, and he hasn't shot the ball as well lately, right? Um but his ability to pull up and stop on a dime is, they always talk about Harden and Doncic, right, deceleration. Yeah. Russell's acceleration and deceleration um, were always phenomenal, even as a freshman and, you know, coming in. We would go and play one-on-one all day long, right? Really? Me, Russ, and James Keith was our class. A dude named Nikola Dragovic, he wasn't there, though. He was, like, jet lagged and tired, so. <laughs> Throw a lot of shade at that. But we play all the time. Honestly, James would win all the games. I hate to say that. Because he's the biggest? Yeah. Because he's the size? Yeah, dude, he hit you like your, his elbow was at your temple, right? Just as, like <laughs> how tall he was. Yeah. And nobody wanted to have a broken nose and pick up playing with, in one on one, late night, one on one, we get yeah. into sneak into the, um, the men's gym or SAC or whatever, SAC or whatever it's called, yeah. and play. But Russell always had that. I think physical development was a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, that allowed him to do all the things that he was already capable of. Mm-hmm. And his body grew into his mind almost, right? So yeah. he saw the things and couldn't quite – because there were ridiculous things that he does and tried to do. Gotcha. But, he, yeah, but the physical sense. ability to do that, right, to catch up with this crazy mentality uh, um, happened, I think, over that year. Yeah. So, so I'm also curious, just as like a – a late, late 2000s, 2000s, just like, like college hoops nerd. nerd. Mm-hmm. That, that was the, the like peak of the Pac-10. Mm-hmm. Late like 2007, 2008, 2009. 2009 mm-hmm. You had James Harden at ASU. Mm-hmm. You had uh, DeMar, DeMar DeRozan at USC. You had Clay Thompson at Washington State. State. You had Russ and Kevin Love no, I thought at Clay UCLA. Was be like that. You had Isaiah Thomas at UW. It's like, like that was loaded. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of those guys were still. They were still kind of under recruited in, in in terms of going to the league and and criticized a bit, right? So like, yeah. oh, people didn't think Clay was going to be there. Oh, the kid from Washington State. You yeah, know what I mean, like I understand he left after two, right? Two, two or three. three. I think mean, yeah. it's three. Okay, but I mean those guys have panned out. It's funny because all those dudes are LA guys, except, except Isaiah. Yeah, but like, yeah, well, I, I, I saw a SoCal guy. What was it like? Like, what was it like going up against? I mean, those guys every night in and night out. It's like every night you're playing against a future NBA. All-Star. Yeah, every night Russ was playing against a future All Star. <laughs> like, you were simulating them in practice, right? Hey, look, you still ask me. Like, you need to be unreasonably confident and very humble to be good. And yeah. the unreasonable confidence is you still ask me, and I'll still tell you I was better in Russell. Right? Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> I, I might still, hey, Russ, still give you buckets, right? <laughs> but, so, our team, I think the guys that you name are yeah. the ones that people know. But even if you look at UCLA, all those guys play at a very high level overseas or played in the league. Yep. Right? Even if you look at some of those other schools, you talk about Isaiah Thomas, but you mentioned uh, Justin earlier, Holiday. Justin and, Holiday. And, and Quincy Pondexter. And, you know, all these guys played at extremely high levels. And the difference between, like, that, that guy that sticks in the league for 10 years versus two years and plays overseas, mm-hmm. it can be really thin. And so what I would say is the Pac-10 was not only 
you know, a guy like DeMar, who was phenomenal yeah. over his career, but, I mean, shoot, last year in particular. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of players, man. And in, and when you and when you look and you go and you look at EuroLeague and you look at these top leagues in overseas, obviously I'm super bullish on it because I played in it and I still give Russ. Well, let's let's talk about that. That's, <laughs> a, that's a perfect segue. So uh, you, you graduated 2010, yeah, and then you went on and played four pro seasons. Yeah, and I stopped early because of I started my you know one of my companies and then went to grad school. Yeah. So things were, I tell you, it took me a little bit of time for two reasons. One, I had an injury. And then the second is you start getting all those minutes and playing, right? And playing and playing and nothing teaches like playing. Yeah. Uh, so I went, uh, I had a couple big games. I knocked down some shots that got attention. And then also my efficiency. We, we I think we looked at it like basketball refers or something like that. <laughs> And the, the, you know, like at the highest level of efficiency, like per 40s or whatever, yeah. were, were quite good. Mm-hmm. So I had a, a, a couple big games when I got opportunities. I played very well. Mm-hmm. I played very well, and we were talking about it earlier, when, uh, you know, Draft Express comes out to look at this guy or that guy, and I get to be a filler. Yeah. I was like, yo, I don't care. This is about you. I'm making this about me, mm-hmm. right? So I got a bit of attention and had support. From people like there was a guy named Todd Ramazar, um, is an, absolutely is an agent. He was at BDA at the time and all that, who kind of helped make sure that, hey, you know, hop into this or do this. And mm-hmm. I met a lot of people, um, and then got the opportunity to play. I played Serbia my first year. Okay. They told me I was playing in Versic. Versic. They told me it was, oh, it's like just outside of Belgrade, right? I right outside the big city, beautiful place, man. <laughs> no, that's like two and a half hours away. But it was an amazing experience in Tiny Town. Mm-hmm. I had this coach named Jeko Lukaic and Dushan, I forget uh, Duki, I'm Duki, Duki's name. I don't even remember his last name. But they were, because the head coach uh, comes through ya, because that means electricity. And, <laughs> and his hair would stand up, like, because he was, he was, dude, you ain't never seen somebody get cussed out till you see <laughs> Struya or like Obradovic. And these guys go <laughs> off on dudes, right? But his hair would stick straight up. They got street, right? He's always electric, right? But um, those guys were some of the smartest basketball minds I had been around. Mm-hmm. And I got to play and play and play. So I'll tell you two things. One is um, I'm trying to think of where I – because I know we got limited time. I don't want to just talk forever. But I, there was a point guard there named Mijan Pavkovic. who was probably like 5'7". Had a little gut. Yeah. You know. Probably smoked cigarettes during that time. <laughs> non athletic. Yo, that dude could play basketball. Yeah. And the way he played, what he saw, um, the passes that he made, it was such a learning experience for me mm-hmm. to be around Struya and, and Dookie, who would translate. And then I learned a pretty good amount of Serbian. And then around Pafke, right, this point guard, like that was an education of 20 years I bet. in like a nine month season yeah um, you've told me about some of those those guys that you know I've even never heard of yeah I mean you hear about the ones that come over like Tia Dosic right. or guys like that or Miritich right. but they're legends over there and they didn't play basketball they never make it over here but they're legendary basketball so we players. were first of all we practiced too much <laughs> two days Oh, yeah, and it's Serbian two-a-days, right? Like, <laughs> There's with, no more NCAA restrictions on how much well, you can no, practice. No, 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 with tape, right? Uh, you tape your ankles because we're, we're gone. Not like two-a-days, yeah. get some shots up, have an hour and a half practice. Like, no, with tape. Mm-hmm. We just got back from a 15-hour plane and bus ride, and like, yeah, yeah we got practice tonight. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the dudes, they drink, uh, I don't drink, <laughs> but one of my t- teammates, he said, uh, he said, oh, yeah, this is Serbian mentality, right? It's like uh, you drink rakia, right, which is like their national uh, drink. Mm-hmm. But then that dude would drink rakia, and then he would be in practice the next morning playing harder than anybody you ever seen, right? And they had this, this fight. Breed. <laughs> it was different, man. Yeah. Um, so between those guys, one of the things I thought Struja did well, which was very confusing to me at the time, is – we would, uh, in practice, he, he was playing all sorts of defenses, right? So he was, like, joysticking strategically on defense in particular. Wouldn't fiddle with the offense too much. 
Okay. But how do you attack all these different defenses and these schemes and the switch attacks, all these things that were really important that were just so confusing at the time? But when you got later and as you matured and got into these games, these situations, these scenarios, is like, no, like, hey, this thing happens. Let the ball go early, mm-hmm. right, and, and shift the defense, right, thinking about, like, how the gravity shifts in different parts of the court. Yeah you started to get a feel for how the ball and how the team could create baskets mm-hmm. against lots of different scenarios, and he made you think constantly. And so that was a fast education. No more like Coach Allen was again in the lane, jump stop, shot fake, shot fake, bounce pass. All the I typical remember, fundamentals. Yo, yeah. I did that over there in the studio. Ay, 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 peach, come blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Dilota, dilota. It's like, Pastor, give the ball. Like, what are you doing? Like. You attack, and the guy's open. I don't care if you throw it around your neck, your back, or whatever. Get rid of the basketball. You play against a hard hedge, drag that thing out like they do in college, yeah. and then set another screen and waste some more time. Then they end up switch, and then you know go and play one-on-one. It was like that hedge goes, you make the first pass. Bang, bang. You don't get the assist, you get the double assist. The hockey, the hockey assist, assist that we right? talk about. And yeah. now, like, yeah, you make the short. You get you hit the short roller. The big is the point forward here. It makes the play. Give up yeah. the basketball. Yeah. And so we got put in so many of those scenarios where you see it happening more in the league now. Yeah. They've been doing that forever, you know. So. So you really got an education on basketball, but how it's played globally. Yeah. How it's played at different levels, not just how it's played in the states, because right. it's not. The and only now way how? And now how it's played in the states? Yeah. Right. Like the game there to me led. There's I, I've got you know good group of friends that are coaches now and they could talk much more about tactics and the transformation of the game and like Mm -hmm. and they'd be great to have on right but Mm -hmm. for me the thing when I was playing that became different is you see all the switches now you see a little more parity and height in the six seven lengthy lengthy guys right everybody switches now which seems to be changing and you see a lot more bullies and you see like the the short strong dudes um, are, are changing the game again but there, that first change was um, how do you use the ball to create uh, mismatches? And a friend of mine, Ross, talks about dominoes and creating that domino effect. Mm-hmm. How do you cl- create as many closeout situations as possible, as quickly as possible? And that means that the ball has to go. The ball has to move. Yeah. And so that's what the game was then. And now I think what it's transformed to in the NBA, where you get a lot of these flow offenses yeah. right, and movement. Because in the playoffs, you can't do the same thing that you did in the regular season, the ball has to move quickly to create the right closeout situation and attack mm-hmm. because guys can defend and everybody can defend. So a lot of that to me, I saw overseas first. And so you started in year one in Slovenia, you said, right? So year one, Serbia. Oh, Serbia. My bad. I, I, dude, I had a, a gnarly little little injury. Um, and, then, uh, and then I played in France, then I played in Slovenia. I played in Germany, okay. brief stint in Lebanon, and back in Germany. So the like wow, okay. you could pick the you could pick the the story of choice, man. I could give yeah. you lots of stories. Well, you know? so I'm curious. You hear about, and I've had a few players on the pod that have played overseas, yeah. whether it be for like a short period of time before they're back in the league, or that's where they play the majority of their career, and it's really a a, a mixed bag in yeah. terms of like. Some situations, like we were at the dinner last night, we were talking about like Brandon Jennings. He was mm-hmm. the one that like really pioneered that like prep to overseas right. route, but it didn't go according to plan for him. Yeah. He, and other he guys, went to, you know, just Roma as a eighteen year old man. Like, yeah, that's it's tough. Hard. Yeah, and some guys they get that route like where they'll be on a team and there's like a limit, like you talked about, how many Americans they can have in the mm-hmm. team, and like nobody speaks English. But other guys have had great experiences. They they make of it, it's, you know, who, they take advantage of the opportunity. It's who you are. It's the player and personality matters, right? So yeah. in Serbia, you could have two international players. Um, and and so it was me and this dude named Jerome Jordan, who was kind of a draft and stash by the Knicks. Like Tulsa, foot. right? Yeah. And I still tell Rome could have made $20 million a year, man. He, like, he could move. He had hands. He had touch. He could shoot the ball. You know, he had the length, all of that. Um, but... In that case, for me, I like learned to speak Serbian. I called all the plays, ran the offense all in Serbian. I would get around the city and I would speak Serbian. Now, it, I wasn't a poet, 
but I learned as much as I possibly could. I was absorbing that. I was uh, going to a baptism for an Orthodox church for a teammate, right? <laughs> to just be around and like, you can go. It's the difference between traveling and, and being a tourist, right? Yeah, the yeah, ability yeah. to be somewhere for nine months uh, with these teammates yeah. uh, who will bring you into their families and their homes you can experience a culture so much more deeply than just about anything you can do. Because even if you move somewhere and live there for like nine months, 12 months, two years, three years, four years, mm -hmm. you're still a foreigner and you, it's hard to get entree into the circle of community. Yeah. And when you're an athlete, when you have built a, like a true brotherhood, right? You've gone through some battles with these guys. Mm -hmm. um, you, get real, you can get really into the culture. Right, you can be, you can really live there, and but a lot of people aren't into that. It's a stepping stone for them. It's like, oh, I want to play back in the exactly. NBA or whatever. For me, like I wanted to play in the league, but I didn't want. I wasn't doing the. I had an opportunity to do the G League thing. I had almost no interest. Oh, in really? It. Yeah, because I wasn't. Dude, you gonna make it out the G League when the GM brought you? Like that stuff is set. Like they know what they're doing, right? They know. There's a reason why they're there. They're, they're playing guys certain ways. Yeah. Also, there's so much transition and turnovers. Like, no, I wanted to go and play high-level basketball and make a lot more money See than the world in the G League. Too. And he experienced that, right? Yep. And I, I mean, in a lot of ways, it was extremely hard. But in a lot of ways, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And year over year, it got, I would say it got better. But there's nothing that replaces that that look up like partisan Belgrade um, fans or something like that. And you see yeah. all these guys in Pioneer Arena and they're, you know, and when you're playing and the drums are beating, I get nostalgic, it's like the dun 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 it's like the rhythm of the game is going. Mm -hmm. And the whole offense, the way that it flows and you play is the same that the fans are bringing. It's not the performance in the NBA when it's like, it's all about the cheerleaders and the dance team and the all that, which is cool. My family loves to go to and see that. Yeah. But the flow of the game was much more football, soccer-like. It's more right? organic. It was, more... it was continuous. It was a flow. And so the way that you actually played the game fit the way that the fan watched the game and participated in the game. It's an and artistry. I, it was, man. And I loved it. I, I really did. And uh, I think about one game in particular. So talking about partisan, we played there. And, um, and I'm sure it's funny now. I, I got two kids, so like. I tell stories and they're like, oh, dad stories. You know, you tell the same stories again. So like, at least my kids are too young. They're not even like, oh, see like, oh dad. But uh, I remember this game as a, as a rookie. We were playing in against Partizan. Mm -hmm. And I still remember, I think any players like this, like I remember a layup I missed, right? Drove baseline. I got a little bit behind the backboard and I tried to like roll and scoop it through. Ball rolled out, right? Like I remember where my foot went and how I missed that shot. You know, 12 years, however many years later. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I made some little things like that didn't go right. A couple missed shots, maybe a turnover here or there. So after the game, we lost to Partizan, um, which is the big club, the historic club there. Mm -hmm. uh, what city? In, in Belgrade. Belgrade. There's two clubs in, in Belgrade that are big ones. Right? There's a bunch of clubs. The big ones are Sedona Zvezda, which is Red Star, and Partizan. And you can imagine, like, Red Star and Partizan. Yeah. There's a lot of history. Hey, you should read, uh, Franklin Four had a book, like how soccer explains the world. And they talk about Red Star and the relationship between some of these clubs and even sort of political movements, militias, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So if you're a sports fan, it's a good yeah. one. And uh, after the game, like, I'm pissed. Right? I'm coming out of college, out of college. Like, you're supposed to be mad after every loss, right? <laughs> like, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, talking to the street, said, what is wrong with you? And so... Duki, who translates, comes over and is like, yeah. Coach says, what's going on, man? Mm -hmm. And um, I said, man, we were frustrated. We had an opportunity to win that game and get points. And I had this opportunity. He's like, man, did you see the SWAT team around the stadium? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. He was like, do you want to go home? <laughs> or do you want to beat them on their home <laughs> court and, and get worried about going home, you know? <laughs> and so, he just want to get out of their lives. Yeah. And you have, a good re you have a good result. And then now you beat them on your home court, right? And mm -hmm. You know, I did the same thing. We beat Besiktas in uh, in Turkey. It was huge, and like we went out to I don't know some little gathering afterwards, and um, 
somebody at yeah, yeah a little I, you know I was yeah, in, I was in bed by like ten o'clock generally man mm-hmm. we went to a club afterwards and somebody asked like oh who'd you play and I, oh Besiktas right and the big club there did you win I was like yeah man I had I had a good game I, I was like yeah man we did we did it we 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 got him man big time win we were, you know Euro Cup my team I was like yo shut up <laughs> it was like. <laughs> We don't belong here, dude. Mm-hmm. Shut up and just like you know, we're going home because the because the game that these clubs, these teams are built into the fabric of culture and is like it's the real deal over there, man. Yeah, so, yeah, it's fun. So you did that for four or five seasons, mm-hmm. and then what what made you finally decide? Uh, maybe it's time to retire. Maybe it's time to go another route. Well, I was in. I and how a, tough of a decision was that? I had a brief way? stint in Lebanon which was you're a bit more of a mercenary over there. you got to go and get buckets. And I was more of a, like, every team I played on, like, we won a championship in Slovenia, two Final Fours in, in Germany, and, like, in Serbia we were really good, right? Um, Lebanon, you got to go and get a, you gotta go get a bucket, mm. right? Which was a little bit different from how I had always played. So I went over there. Um, I could get into all the agent stories and all that stuff, but... Long story short, I went over to Lebanon, in, uh, just outside of Beirut. Lebanon's a fascinating country if you think about the number of different cultures and religions that have all been incorporated into government in order to create this balance of power in a very tricky place to have a balance of power. There's a lot of Christians and you know, you know um, Christians and, and and Muslims and different sects of uh, you know Sunni and Shia and all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, all kind of overlaps, so it's a very interesting place. So every club in Lebanon basically had a political team, political affiliation to mm-hmm. some degree. Some were very tight, some were very loose. Mm-hmm. And so I went over to Lebanon uh, after a year in Germany and uh, played over there. And I wake up one morning eating my Kellogg's or, or, or <laughs> cornflake knockoff, right? And I was like, yo, uh, you know, Hoops BC replaces uh, blah, 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 brings in new, uh, brings in new American. I was like, what? <laughs> like, you heard yo. you got replaced. Ain't that. nobody say nothing to me, and I was like, "Yo, I'm playing well, all right." Like, so I read it as a, as a guard. I'm like, "Ah, oh, hold up, man, hold up." My coach called. I called. Or I don't know. Maybe I called my coach. I was like, "Name was Omar." Omar. What's up, man? He was like, "I just found out about this. Nobody asked me, you know, on and on and on, right?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, "This is not cool." Right, and yeah. so he asked me to play. Um, he, he asked me to play. I need you to play one more game. I said I'm not going to stick around. Like I'm not about to do this. And like he said, I need you to play one more game. You know, Syrians. You know, civil war and, and <laughs> what that became was going on. He, you know, he was like, "Look, did my job is on the line here too. Like I need you." Okay, damn. and I was like, I was like, "Damn, like." <laughs> But okay. like you guys are going to cut me loose yeah, after the yeah, game. So, yeah, it wasn't him, but, like, you're talking about, man, this is life or death. I'm like, all right, man, I'll put, <laughs> like, I'll, of course I'm going to play. What are you going to say to the guy, man? He treated me right. Yeah. And so um, that's all going on. You need a little more context. I had applied. I wanted international policy was always, like, something I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, I applied to Stanford and said if I, I only applied to one place, like, all right, I'll try this. If I get in, like, might do it. And then I was starting this company. Uh, so I was like, I applied to Stanford because I wanted to be in the Bay. You know, I was like, hey, there was an engineer I started work with. I was totally green as an entrepreneur. So I wanted to, wanted to experience that. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of have multiple opportunities there. So go and do that. So I applied. I got in. I went to, uh, and I started the company. So I go and I play this game. I had my best game. It was like 30 and 10. Um, and... I still remember all this. I remember every... I don't know how it is. I think it's because it's got to be something chemical. I remember every single move, every single play. Fake the guy, <laughs> shot fake, stepped through, and left the ball short. It was just like... It, I still like, yo, that's a bucket right there. You <laughs> can't do that, right? And um, But I had a good game. And afterwards, the president calls me to his office, and he basically said, like, yo, I'll triple your money. Like, I want you to stay. This had to wow. do with sponsors, and they wanted this, and blah, blah, blah. I was like, nah, I'm, I'm leaving. So I left, wow. went and played in Germany um, the rest of that year. Mm-hmm. 
knew I was going to go to you know Stanford was going to so I left it I left it kind of early when things were going up and and, and ticking up for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the decision was difficult, but this is where like your audience might get lost and not want to listen to you anymore because I'll start philosophizing. No, I love but, it. But um, I treated these things as all being very similar, right? Yeah. So like you have a craft, um, you're pursuing uh, a savage pursuit of mastery. Yeah. You're building a culture and a team and entrepreneurship started to feel like that for me. And so it didn't matter that if you were shooting the ball or coaching the team or starting a company or playing with your kid, right? It doesn't matter. All of those things, if you're doing it right, are about sort of this presence and this application of development of craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the transition was smooth. Um, There's probably a lot of other reasons. I went from a team to a cohort, a small cohort of international students. I was building something, right? I was pursuing something that had purpose and meaning and all that. Mm -hmm. So the transition was okay, other than like a little bit of the the chip on your shoulder sometimes um, and memories of like that shot you missed and all that or the shot you made. But the transition was fine for me. So I played in Germany, Mm -hmm. went to the Final Four and then um, I said, all right, I'm going to stop it and keep going. Really? And, and try something new. Wow. The only thing yeah. I feel bad about is that I had a teammate named Mike Roll. And, like, <laughs> I'm a better shooter than Mike Roll. I don't think he's ever listened to your podcast, but I'm going to send him this podcast. Yeah, and yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. I'm the best shooter. Like, uh, <laughs> And I didn't get to prove that because he kept playing and, like, his three-point percentages and numbers are higher than mine. But, like, that that I'm a little salty about. Okay. So, yeah. so we got Sean Rekha. You, you're better than Russ. I'm better than everybody, better than, man. Better shooter than Mike. Grohl. I told you, you have to be del- you have to be totally delusional to do. Got to have a couple screws. What did I t- what did I tell you when we made, did that application? What was it? Uh, and you were like, "Wait, what, bro? Like, did you say that about me?" It's like <laughs> delusional positive. Oh yeah, yeah, you said I have delusional positivity. Yeah, that was like. Thing. I know, coming from you, like, I know what that means, but is somebody else going to understand yeah, that? Yeah, well, if they don't understand it, then they ain't the right person, man. Because you have to be able to think that this thing is possible or achievable, right? Yeah. You can't be, if you if you think or do like everyone else, like, how can you do something different, right? Yeah. Your mind has to function differently. And either, and you have to create that thing, mm-hmm. right? You have to, Russell Westbrook or, I'm not comparing him to him, but you look at some of these greats like a Kobe or Jordan, they, they man, they made up enemies, you know, yeah. like, you know, Kobe's dark muse type thing. Like, that's how he achieved it. Others have achieved it um, different ways by finding presence in a different way. Or you, to me, is like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, oh, I'm going to produce a Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me try it. You Absolutely. Know? And, and if I, it might not be perfect the first time but after a couple reps like i'm gonna get better yeah and so i yeah a little a little delusional not totally delusional (laughs) but yeah you can have that on record (laughs) (laughs) so all right so you you come back to the states you start grad school at stanford i didn't realize you well so this might be the perfect time to transition into kind of boost Mm -hmm. and how that came to life and what boost is do you want to describe i guess because obviously i know what it is yeah do you want to describe a little bit so, what Boost is and how it came about and how you pivoted over the years? So there's a couple of things. I think this. So summer 2014, Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. I grew up in Florida and Florida, Ferguson are like right next to each other. So I remember being there and at those protests and listening and traveling and being with community and all that, trying to listen and understand and, you know, feeling all of these things. And so I went to Stanford, started as a, a design school project company called, uh, we called it like Pact back then. It became what's My90. And My90 was a software accountability toolkit uh, for police accountability. We would sell uh, and and, um, police interaction and engagement, excuse me, community interaction and engagement. So we would sell to public safety agencies, police um, departments, Mm -hmm. oversight, communities, all of that. So started this company. and we could talk more about that, but my then recruited my wife, would be wife. Like we tag teamed it together and she became CEO. Mm-hmm. We sold that company to Axon Enterprises last year. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which was has been amazing. And she's an amazing leader, and she's doing awesome things with that. Seeing it roll out all over the country. Absolutely. So that that's like summer 2014 rolling in, and at the same time, I started something called Boost. Mm -hmm. And Boost at the time was really about. At first, it was about we built these these models. We recorded like 700 videos, and built a model to deliver. To customize training mostly for youth and then you could record yourself and upload the video and I had coaches and they would uh, hit a button and get feedback on the video send it back to you mm -hmm. so it was all this kind of training experience mm -hmm. I mean we put a paywall we had thousands and thousands and thousands of users and thousands of videos and once you put a paywall up like <laughs> really <laughs> how do you make money right it was tricky yeah we were just you know, talking for about a this. lot of reasons we could talk about that pivoted into okay but what do those kids really care about? They want to get recruited, right? They yeah. want to see themselves in, at the next level. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, that's where we're going to kind of focus. And we started looking at like, oh, hold on a second. Coaches look at this and recruit. They have a huge problem and need. And we had this model, skills kill politics. Mm -hmm. So we started um, collecting data on athletes. We were going to do it using computer vision. But my co-founder, Inga, who is always like, prioritizing yeah like, I'm, I can spin up our computer vision team she's an augmented reality expert but I'm not doing it until you prove this out so I went and bought a bunch of sensors and started running combines all over the world like Osaka and Kobe and Winnipeg and St. Louis and LA wow. and all, wow. collecting data from pros yeah and from kids and then I could show them with a comparison where you could do a little prediction then we started having the combines and we'd invite coaches mm -hmm. and the coaches could watch and see the combine get the objective data but also i had scouts that would um sort of annotate code i don't know how they would scout it but it would be in a formalized categorized process for players gotcha this is where a story came on came came from of like we had a big one in akron um because i played with a dude named drew joyce mm -hmm. and his dad uh drew joyce um senior uh he had um maybe it was a second but whatever he was a coach at st v's right he was a bronze coach and all that yep so we had hoopers there so like malachi was there brandon malachi brandon was yep. there the kid from out here jared mccain we had like a bunch of players several pros several i would say half of the group d1 players and like 10 or 12 high major guys wow and we set this up we collected data we had the coaches all this like really really cool the story is that, like, that was when we didn't have any money. And so, <laughs> this is the, were you there when, earlier when we were talking about this? Yeah, I uh, was. Yeah, yeah. Man. And it was, it was embarrassing, man. Like, I, I set up the room and the suites and all that stuff. And it, I thought I got a deal, man. It was roaches in there. It was people doing some illicit activities, you know, in the... In the in the the you, hotel room above, and you know, you but, brought all these kids in. For I the brought combine. some hoopers. I, yeah, I brought my brother, who's a player now, University yeah. of Idaho. And I had my dad. I had Shay there. All like, dude, we had all these people there. Man. It was <laughs> rough times, but so that's where like Boost started. Yeah, it was thinking about training and and uh, bridging the gap between player and and um, and, and and coach. It started because my kid brother at the time, like I was overseas and I wanted to train my younger ah, brother. Yeah. Right? So we started with the optical see through glasses and I had, you've seen the videos. I've seen the videos. But you should have the experience of all this stuff that you're seeing now with AR, like we built a lot of that. It was just we were way too early. Yeah. Pivoted into the training, pivoted into the combines, pivoted into delivering um, an analytics tool for coaches, right? And that's when I hit you up again, was like, hey, yep. now we're starting to have some traction. And in the end, what Boost is, is we do, I mean, it's, it's data-driven storytelling, and we use that to um, ignite fan bases and build communities, and then we connect them to marketplaces, right? Yeah. So Christian now, like we've had this long-standing <laughs> friendship, but now Christian runs all the product design. It started with the coaching platform, mm -hmm. but now we're building end-to-end -end AI powered products, uh, websites, stories, automated recaps, previews, visualizations, pairing a recap with video, automated video highlights and then um, uh, punching in merch mm -hmm. and you know digital goods, all that are relevant and tied to a story where the emotion is high. So trying to connect these communities up 
and then you know the business model in this case is a, is, is a transaction. Mm-hmm. So we've uh, that's what we do. That's what we built over these years. It's grown. We sold the company uh, last year, last October, and then we launched. A, and this is what you have to hold for a couple of weeks: a joint venture with the what conference, mm-hmm. which is big time, absolutely amazing. Because now, like you, the only thing that matters if I was to give my sort of advice I got from a guy named Arian Forohar who sold his company to Sport Radar, a big data provider and, and um, data analytics and betting provider of sports books and media companies. Absolutely. Biggest in the world. So he told me, he was like, dude, nobody cares about your technology. And I was like, I'm going through it right now. I was like, man, Arian, man, leave me alone. He's like, no, it's about distribution and it's about rights. Mm. And so to do that when you play with these sports properties you want to get rights mm-hmm. you got to pay a lot of money yep right sure you do. want distribution that's why these sports books or stuff have massive customer acquisition costs right it's like yeah. why they're buying up all these you know smaller media companies why they're doing all this stuff is distribution and rights and we were able to bring a technology layer to that yeah. to exploit the distribution and the rights build something together and now you know the first iteration is the big 10 but now we've got multiple big deals that are done that we'll share soon uh, where we're powering storytelling and fan engagement in a whole new way across the world across many 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 sports Mm -hmm. and it was i mean it's it's funny now to see where the company is having known because i knew that story and I know how long of a journey it was going from, you know, the app for training kids to this company, like an, an actual company now doing partnerships and, and deals with, you know, some of the biggest brands and identities in sports. And so I just like seeing that whole end to end process, I can't help but think like, and we've talked about this before, like the 99.9% of entrepreneurs and startups that don't make it. And so as, as an entrepreneur myself, it's like, do you ever just take a step back and think like, damn, like I did that. I yeah, made what, that. Do you let but, yourself do that I, or not? What I, what I tell you about this discussion about the greatest of all time. Yeah, you can't, you can never be satisfied. It's not only you can never be satisfied, but you just didn't roll your ankle, right? That's Look true. at a guy like Grant Hill. That's true. Those foot injuries, you know what I mean? Like you, or, or a guy like Steph Curry, who had all those ankle injuries and was fortunate enough to be able to come back, right? Yeah. You, the ball bounced here. I swear, we talk about Russell, I swear the ball always bounced in his hands. <laughs> and I think part of it is like, like when I did something, the ball bounced away and somehow it was a turnover and somehow somebody picked it up so his turnover ratios weren't, weren't that bad. I'd be like, yo, man, like how come he didn't turn the ball over? But I think it's about the ability to put your place in the right place, the right time, bring the right people and survive because you get, there is a lot of randomness involved. And to underestimate that is to overinflate what you think you did. And I don't yeah, think you can let it happen. But I, I also think you're being too humble in this regard because one of the things that I've always thought was amazing and I've admired about you as a leader and as an entrepreneur is the ability to pivot and always seem to pivot to the right decision. But I guess part of it is, you know, following the money, right? Jorge Costa right there, man. It's it's following the the money. (laughs) But being able to pivot seeming like so seamlessly from one idea to the next to the next and make it all so cohesive and make it make sense. It's just like, it's incredible. It it makes sense when... when Like it's a testament to the entrepreneur. I think that's I think that's part of it. But if you look at how all this works, so one, I got Inga as a co-founder, right? Who had all of this experience, and the stories about that is funny. Like two totally different people, like Russian woman from Siberia, that made it from the least likely circumstances you could ever imagine in tech, and then built and sold companies, and we come together, and that's the first thing. So when I started, I got Inga. Right, like, and she is like my sister now, but she battles and fearless and is willing to take those risks and finds ways to do things. Okay, mm-hmm. then 
the first, you know, real hire is like uh, Jorge. Mm-hmm. Right, so we go, Jorge was that you need to get him on the pod, man. But he ran an analytics shop yep. for the Pistons. And so as we start to move into this, like, yo, I got Jorge to join. It's not totally rational why someone would join and do some of these things. Yeah. And then even some of the folks that Inga recruited um, internationally on the engineering side, we had a dude named Dennis. Amazing person. Mm-hmm. And able to, like, he had the mindset. So the idea is that, yeah, you can have a good coach more like a good GM, dude, the players, the players play. And so my approach to building teams is, one, you got to establish a culture about honesty and all that stuff, transparency. Yep. But I recruited really talented people that were entrepreneurial. So that was one thing I liked about you. Like, I didn't care, you know, like, oh, okay, you know, like, I'm not, I want to, like, a code evaluation. For, for Christian wasn't the thing at that time. Like, I didn't care about yeah. I wanted an entrepreneur. Okay, started something before, mm-hmm. started multiple things before, mm-hmm. and was had the ability to learn and pivot. And I could, like, if you have an entrepreneur, you run the risk that people are going to, like, push back sometimes. But that's how, like, the innovation happens. So when you do have to make a decision or pivot, you have the, the the team with you to run fast. So now, if you look at That's where we're at, look at where we're at now, like, and I, you know, I don't want to forget any names, but I even think about we're now in this this product we're building. You got like Nick mm-hmm. Burke, mm-hmm. dude. If I was straight up Christian, if it was just me and you without Nick, or <laughs> it, it wouldn't it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Right. But also, what's Nick's background? Had his own company, was building Entrepreneur. tools for coaches on his, on the same thing. Yep. Like different mindset, L- can be leader, autonomous. Even look at like Enzo, right? What'd you tell me? You know how Jorge liked Enzo? It's a data scientist for us. It's like, yeah, Enzo was like building his own tools and things like that on his own. He was solving problems. So you want entrepreneurs and problem solvers. Yeah. And once you have that in your core and you have a, a, a framework um, and culture, and that structure is set, then you can start getting other talented people and it all just, it all goes. So if you look at what we've done, the only reason we've done it is because not even like staying in the flow of money, is having the people that can do these things and are entrepreneurs so they push you who ultimately makes the quote unquote final decision to make the right decision. That's an interesting way to look at it. And one thing that Nick, you know, says to me sometimes is, you know, Iron sharpens iron. And it's true. It's like you get people that that come from that entrepreneurial background that are, are self-motivated, self-starters, yeah. you know, kind of pushing against the social norm yeah. a little bit. And you get that many people together. Yeah. It's almost like... Keep going, man. Something... I'm going to give you the full quote because people forget the full quote. Keep going, man. Yeah, but it's just like, it's really true. You get people like that that are self-confident creators, builders, confident in what they're doing, and really the sky's the limit. Right. And when you really break it down like that, it is kind of the common thread throughout our team, our company. Right. That is, man, there's a, this actually in my, uh, my sort of knowledge of the, of the Bible is, is limited. I'm not, I'm not Christian, but if you look at that full quote, I think it's really interesting, right? Like, you, you build up your brother, your sister, right? You iron sharpens iron. And at the same time, the other part of that, like, interpretation is, is really about um, what a friend says to you really matters. Yeah. And it can wound you, right? So I, I, I'll, I'll look at the same, like, usually look at the full quote. And those two things, I think, are it, mm-hmm. right? Iron sharpens iron. We can make each other tougher. Like, there's a bit of tough love. We, we help each other. And the words of a friend can really hurt or wound or take away from you. And so the thing that we want to encourage is to challenge each other and support each other, right? And so the thing that I love about, like you bring up Nick or Hori, they both do a great job, is, um, is they empower people, right? It's not like, like this whole idea of like a manager is so stupid, right? It's not a manager, it's someone who's like, as the person on the hierarchy in the org chart, you're up here. No, like what you're really doing is lifting that other person up and getting the F out their way, right? Because the words 
and the things that you do can be so limiting mm -hmm. if you don't get out the way, right? And so the balance of those two things is what makes like a really, really good, really yeah. good leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's true too, and that's also another thing that I mean, not to you know go off on, on a whole tangent about like our company and what we do so well, but it's your story is like there's no there's no barriers there's no like none of that like the, the divisiveness that you may have in like a traditional company it's not like somebody is above somebody else i mean yes at the end of the day like people have different titles and different positions but one of the things that's so cool about what you've built with boost is everybody has a say it's like everybody almost feels like they're on equal footing in terms of like they can have their voice heard it's why cross house is like has a is even a thing yeah right it's because people have ownership and yeah when feel, people have ownership they, they feel, feel invested right exactly. and, and ownership is not just about like in this case the token you own or like the shares you own but it's also like how you're treated mm -hmm. right and and as a founder as an owner you think differently yeah you cannot expect everyone to be like a you know the founder or do whatever like oh don't pay me oh i'll work all night oh yeah. i'll take every risk like not that type of it but it's I care about this thing and these people. So we were talking, uh, Nick was telling me, he was talking to you, and he was like, oh yeah, on Christian, on Fridays, it's always great to make sure you really close out that day and to set up everybody for success. Yep, we talk about on that On Monday, lot. right? Yep. I was talking to, to Marty about this when we had lunch the other day. And I think that's great, and why? Because when you got European engineers, they get there on Monday, you created they didn't lose nine hours because on Friday you closed it out, got them set up with your tickets and everything like that. Well, why does that matter? Because if you do this three months in a row, you've created four fresh days, right? Mm -hmm. Three months in a row, that's 12 days. Yeah. And so when you get to launch, you bought two weeks. So when you get to launch, something is inevitably going to go wrong. But everybody has had that much more time to... to battle test and battle hard in this stuff yeah. you just save somebody from having their whole weekend blown up when they were supposed to be with their kids yeah. because like oh crap like we launched this product and stuff's going wrong yeah. so that is why you do this that is thing in my opinion that's thinking like an owner yeah right it's like not just about the monetary thing but it's because like now i'm gonna like i'm helping out my partner my you know that co-founder mentality is if, if you can preserve that you can build amazing things and have a lot of fun doing it. Absolutely. What's the biggest misconception about being an entrepreneur or being a founder, CEO? Yeah, you got to be totally, <laughs> it's totally irrational. It's the, it, it, like, there's not, that makes sense. Like, if you were to do it, like, financially and, uh, like, you were to count the dollars, because you said the 99.9%, .9%, right? And then there's the 0.1% that make a billion dollars when they, you know, go public or whatever, right? Um, there's a lot of hours a lot of things can go wrong it's tough most people don't get it you know uh, it's hard mm -hmm. right but I would not do anything else mm -hmm. because you know quote unquote man in the arena to like participate yeah. and build and do things like yeah it's hard to it's hard to, you know, the old commercials, like priceless type things like that. That is priceless. I wouldn't change it. The other thing is you can control your environment and what you do. Like, I'm fine. I can stand on my own integrity. I can, um, even if I fail, mm -hmm. I can stand on the decisions that I and my team made. I can choose my team. Right. Yeah. There's nothing. My, my wife, uh, who is amazing, like I said, she led my 90s. She started her own not for profit. Like, she is an amazing leader. And... But sometimes she gives me a hard time. Come down to L.A., she's like, yo, like, what you doing in L.A.? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, you got work. We got some meetings, and I haven't been. She does her thing, too. I'm like, we got two young ones, you know? So, you know, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I'll meet up with Christian. She's like, like yeah, and I'll meet up with Austin, and then me and Inga, and then I'm going to Ari, and, then, you know, to meet up with Horace and going to you. She's like, work you get any work done like that work like, like you're going on vacation in socal is what we're, you're doing we're, we're networking no we're networking. but that the thing is like why would you want to spend time with people that you don't like or care about yeah absolutely. you know so it's like yeah this is this is a craft i don't even look at it as work so as an entrepreneur as a ceo i think 
is stressful, is terrible, is irrational, but you're crafting this thing and you're choosing the people that you craft it with. They're making you better and you enjoy it. So now I get to see my friends and this community that yeah. I care about. Yeah. Like that is the, that's the, like, did, you know, storytelling and like it's cool stuff, the deals we made and, you know, maybe there's revenue involved and all that kind of stuff. Like that's cool. Mm-hmm. But over these last years, I have friends, community, people for life. And I don't care what you say, like that, the thing that was hardest about leaving basketball is my favorite part about basketball was practice and team dinner. You know? <laughs> really? Yeah. And I love this, the show. Like I love the big games and the big moments and all that. But yeah. it was that feeling in practice. When coach lets you run, you're playing, you know, getting up and down fives or whatever. You're playing scenario, okay, first to seven, three minutes on the clock. Do it, you're just hooping with your boys. Yeah. And then in the locker room, you ice up, you're sitting around, and you're talking trash, and then you go to dinner. And it was, it was just great. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that's the thing that was important to have that community, that team, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, people talk about, you know, family and this and that. And, like, no, to me, like, being teammates is, a, is, a, is enough. And we make each other better. We, and I've enjoyed all of this, even the hard times. Yeah. You know, somebody was – I had – I created a group of advisors and teammates that I could talk to. So if you're starting something, I think the solo founder thing is for the birds, man. Because mm-hmm. you're missing the whole – you're missing the whole experience, the Absolutely. whole thing. Yeah, it's all about relationships mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And that is by far the most rewarding part. You know, even for me, for being a part of this company that you've built is like, like how many people can say like, like they hang out with like their coworkers or their boss, mm-hmm. like their boss essentially mm-hmm. like this, like and record a pod or shoot the mm-hmm. shit or like go have dinner in Malibu or just like hang out. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's very rare mm-hmm. that you get that kind of relationship. But when you do, it's like, that's for life. Yeah, man. man. Absolutely. And you, you do thing after thing after thing again, because what else would you really want to do? Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, like, I mean, it's, it's hard to go with Jay-Z, you know, have filet mignon you can't go back to hamburger helper man you can't go back to just making widgets you know what i mean no like, it's not it's not it yeah it's not it no man what else what else do you want to talk about i we talked about a lot i don't know but, man I, I feel like your audience went to sleep when like yo this dude started talking about some no, philosophy man. or whatever man uh, this, i mean this you're hearing from someone who's who's lived it and who's done it and so you know who's been successful at it so if there's listeners who are, you know, uh, in that entrepreneurial mindset who I know there are from Krause yeah. House or whoever that is listening. You know, this conversation is going to be applicable to what they're trying to do. Yeah, hopefully, man. I think the, so to those entrepreneurs, like we said, build your team. You can't be afraid to, can't be afraid to pivot. You know, to get stuff out there very quickly and learn yeah. and listen, right? So yeah. the thing that I would say, and I think about this actually to Cross House, right? Because you all are on the bleeding edge of things is that... Um, like think about what you, you you think about what you want to build, right? So before that is you have to understand like why am I building something? Like yep. what do people want? Mm-hmm. And then there's the meta question of like what do they want to want? And once you understand that, you can think about okay, this is what to build. Mm-hmm. And before you build it, you need to evaluate the externalities, mm-hmm. right? It's like okay. What could I change in the world if I put this thing into the world? What will I mess up in the world when I put this thing into the world, Mm -hmm. right? And making sure that you're building things and doing things and thinking about that. Otherwise, like, because, like, yo, the disruption thing is is great. And then the grown-ups come and, like, clean it all up. And, like, you broke some things. But I don't like that Silicon Valley mentality. I I think it's dumb. I think it is up to you or us and I think across us because it's so technology evolved and mm-hmm. it's bleeding edge is like okay what do we what could we do wrong here mm-hmm. right are we making the world a better place are we changing all the like really really philosophical out questions out there and then once you evaluate that and say okay take a deep breath like this here's our, our risk like let's go and do it yeah but if you don't think about that like I, 
you don't get the pass to me of like, oh yeah, we didn't even we didn't even we didn't even think about that, you know. Like the like uh, there's a, it's a different technology, you know. Um, I was reading about and these scientists build stuff with like deep fakes, right? And so like you can, you know, someone's voice and facial expression and yeah. they're like, oh, this is awesome, you know, the great use of AI and computer vision. It's like, yeah, but did y'all? So the question I heard him on a like a radio lab a long time ago asked the question. Did you think about or even consider? Oh no, I did it. That this could be used in this way, right? Yeah. And that to me is the thing I think about in technology and entrepreneurship. You don't get a pass in my book. Mm-hmm. You know, you might mess something up, but if you didn't take the time and have the process to evaluate that thing, yeah, we we've, we've been there and done that. So yeah. that would be my only thing to. All the people building all sorts of crazy stuff in Krauss House, right? And all, all the people stuff, like man. me were building new crazy things. <laughs> you know, we got to hold ourselves accountable. Do you think you're going to be a serial entrepreneur your entire life? Hey, man, I, I always got a little something going on, <laughs> man. <laughs> I always got a little something going on. The, ne- the next thing I will tell you right now, yeah, you're going to be like, what? You know, like, I can't believe it. So... I me want, personally? Oh yeah, you personally. You're gonna be like, "What is this dude doing?" Something I don't know about. Oh, man, oh, hey man, <laughs> ask me no questions. Tell you no lies, man. Okay. You know, it's got a little, okay. little something okay. going on. I think so. The next thing is no, I don't know if I'll be a serial entrepreneur, entrepreneur all of my life. But the things that I think about now that I care about two things: one is community, I care about client, and so some of the things I've started building, investing in, thinking about are where those two things overlap mm-hmm. um, and creating as much value as fast as possible where you're building community, returning resources and value back to community yeah. and at the same time uh, attacking some of these big sort of issues around environment and, and, and climate uh, as much as you, you know, impacting them as much as you can. So. This, and so going back to the whole like Almost like, are you going to like leave the world a better place and like you found it kind of mm-hmm. thing? Like with sport, like playing devil's advocate for somebody who like would be like, well, how, how would you achieve, how do you achieve that? How do you make the world a better place through sport? But it all comes back to the community aspect, right? That's it. Because in the end, you're just throwing a ball through a, a ring. Yeah. And, you know? But it's so, like you said, it's all relationships. It is. So all the community building, you build. I'll give you an example. So my wife built this, uh, it's called Goals Haiti, right? Mm-hmm. And so she built this organization. Um, she hired all these people, uh, uh, these Haitians, right? So it wasn't like she parachuted in and then left and brought a bunch of, you know, U.S. Americans in. And you know, she built it from the ground up in Haiti, learned the language, lived there for three years. Wow. And what did they do? They created soccer teams. But if you play on the soccer team, right, you get a meal, right? So they've served thousands and thousands and thousands of meals. Right? Wow. Play on the soccer team, well, I you got to plant trees and do community cleanup. If you want to play, if there is a uh, boy soccer team, there has to be a girls soccer team. The numbers have to match. So in a place where like, oh, girls can't, you know, girls aren't going to play, you'll get the boys recruiting girls because they want a new team to be started. And, yo, we need girls so they can start a, a girls team too. That's right? awesome. That's, that's soccer, sport, yeah. that's community. Right? So the same thing here. If you're looking at Krauss House, like, all right, in the end, we're talking about throwing a ball through the rim, but what are you building? Community, okay? We're thinking about governance in a different way. We're thinking about returning value and distributing capital in a, in a different way. Ownership, um, uh, creating new things, new art, new experiences, because like the experience itself, like, yeah, we're here, we're living here, so yeah. <laughs> we should enjoy this thing. You're creating a an artifact that hopefully will live on when the aliens come down, like, you know, in a, a 500 million years, like, yo, those, these, you know, let me listen to this thing, right? And obviously joking a bit, but yeah. that's where sport can play the role of, of community and of a craft. Um, Cause I will also say, again, like they might've fallen asleep, I don't know. But this concept, all right, this concept of craft, I was like, I, uh, what's her name? Joan? Didion, forget, there's this author. A friend gave me a book a long time ago. He's uh, collected short stories. Mm-hmm. And one of the stories it talks about 
we can talk about all these high and mighty things and all the things we want to do and what's important and not, but if you can't stop and bounce a baby on your knee or play ball with a friend, like, what are we even, like, doing? You know, the classic mm-hmm. field of dreams, like, couldn't never play catch with his dad and his kid, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, also, this craft, you know what, shoot, it's okay. As long as you're not effing up, the, messing up the world, in my opinion. It's like, yeah, build this art, build this team, do this thing. Yeah. So that's all right, too. It doesn't all have to be, you know, changing the world, even if that's some of the things that I think a lot of us want to do. Yeah, you know? yeah. This has been awesome. Cool, man. I appreciate the time. Yeah, no, it's always, it's all, I love, you know, our conversations, you know, that we have on the phone, it's like we just go down so many rabbit holes, whether it be about, you know, hoops or life or work or whatever, but it's totally different to do it in person. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and, I, and I didn't even start talking about Tai Chi, man. I even, <laughs> I shielded people from all my, like, martial arts and Tai Chi stuff, dude. Oh, man. So this was, I would call this a success, man. We had yeah. a great conversation, and I didn't even go, I didn't go to, <laughs> I didn't start talking about sci-fi and fantasy and theoretical math and all that. So oh you, you kept me in line, dude. You kept me in line. Well, so I guess I got, because at the end of the day, this is a, a basketball podcast. Before I let you go, I'd be remiss if I asked, you know, you have any hot takes or anything you want to get off your chest, anything you want to talk about? Because, I mean, the, the NBA season is a couple weeks yeah. around the corner. By the t- It'll be right here by the time this podcast drops. It is. It is. Um, damn, why does everybody hate so hard on Ben Simmons? That's a question. He kind of brought a lot of that uh, on upon himself. Yeah, I know, but I feel like he got... He, got, he reacted to something. I'm just questioning. He's brought a lot of it. Because he, he has brought a lot of it, especially in the, in the end, recently on himself. But as a player, why does everyone, why did they, why did they go at him so hard? He's still a fringe, almost all-star. Like, he's a very good player. Oh, you yeah. got to ask yourself that. Yeah, That's for your pod to think about. <laughs> uh, Drew Holiday is a beast. And I still Facts. think he's totally underrated. Facts. Um I think the Clippers are going to be good this year. I know that everybody's been saying that. Shout out to my guy, a friend of mine, Chad, and I've been watching Jason Preston. I think he's going to be very good. I hope he gets some minutes. He's a great passer. Watch this kid. Yeah. And um, what else, man? I think the Clips are going to the West Coast Finals. Who's going to win the championship? Who? Um, right now, I'm, I'd say Bucks. I'll say Bucks. I'll say Bucks. Uh, I'm going, I'm going with, Drew. Yeah, I'm going with Milwaukee. I love Giannis too. That dude is entertaining as all get. I think he's gonna awesome be. Game. I think he's gonna be MVP in this year. I think he's gonna gonna go for his third one. I yeah. think he's fresh off of just dominating the what they had the yeah. Euro Cup or something yeah. this summer. Just dominating. Commodore is gonna love this. Yeah. Commodore, one of the co-creators of Krause yeah, House. Yeah, is he a, flexes. Is, is, he a is he a Milwaukee fan? Oh yeah, okay. Bucks, everything. Oh. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, through and through. So, okay. Commodore, okay. this this. Hey, Commodore, how's this Wisconsin for football this year? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, I'll say Bucks. I mean, I'll say Bucks Dubs, but I, I could very plausibly see Bucks Clippers. Yeah. Okay. Bucks Clippers. So you even uh. In the, East, in the Eastern Conference, you threw, uh, you threw Boston out. They're gonna no, I'll say, I'll say Bucks over Celts in the Eastern Conference Finals. Are they going to pick it up without the, without the I think so. staff turnover? The I young guy, so. I forget his name. I've heard, I've heard good things about Missoula him. Missoula is the yeah. new guy who's replacing Yudoka. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, we can, we can get into the Celtic stuff on another episode. Yo, is Draymond but, getting suspended for how long? He should. I had, this, had the video, I didn't of see the video. Was not bad? come out. It was bad. Had the video not come out, they could have just brushed it under the rug. But I think they're probably pissed that it came out because now they're gonna have to do something. Yeah. Which they rightfully should. He, you can't swing on a teammate like that in practice. I don't, I don't think. I don't, know, I don't know what he did. Yet. I, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll watch the video after this. But uh, I don't know what he did. You know I don't think now. it'll kill their morale. That team has been so good for so long. I don't think it's gonna it affect it. Nah. But yeah, I'll you, go Bucks. He made contact. I didn't see. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It looked like he knocked him. Out clean. I will say Draymond is different, dude. <laughs> he great podcaster, by the way. We gonna get Dray on the pod, man. <laughs> I've seen him working out over UCLA in the men's gym a couple times during the off season. Yeah, yeah. High impact guy, man. Yeah, he is. I mean, we've had debates on this on past episodes about you know, on court, is he more valuable than Steph? 
to the Warriors and what they're trying to do in their system. Dude, Steph Curry's work rate is absolutely insane, and there's nothing that can replace that. The like his work ethic? Work ethic, but his work rate, like the amount of movement, the amount of ground he covers, oh, okay. the way he can, like Russell does with the basketball. Yeah. Right? And people criticize him for it, right? Russell yeah. does with the basketball. He draws so much. Yeah. But Steph does that without the basketball oh, and yeah. with the basketball. And I remember, I don't remember what conference finals or finals it was. I can get all these years mixed up now, but they lost. It might have been when Clay was out, and um, I watched him. Like, they weren't going to win, right? And I watched the amount of ground he covered and how hard he played. I was like, that dude, he, he needs more respect than even he gets. Mm. So I think, but at the same time, I remember when they lost that first finals, kind of rumor was Draymond kind of lost it in the locker room um, and went at people. But you need... You need a Draymond Green, man. So that that's like to an extent. I, I, I wasn't there. You I mean, the reason Green. why I think they lost the finals is because he lost. He got he got suspended. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So he's a blessing and a curse. What was the? I'm trying to think of the years, man. What was the first one that they lost? They won 2015, lost 2016. That was when they blew the three one lead. Right. They won 2017, 18, lost 19 to the Raps. Right. 2021, they were out, came back 22, and they won right. as the Celtics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Draymond is a fair shake for the rest? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I get so tired of all these dudes whining, man. Oh yeah. You know, it looks it looks bad. I think it's yeah. a bad reflection on the league yeah. sometimes. All right. To last, the extent. Last one, then we'll shut this down. I yeah. Have a question no, for you. I love the hoop song. Variable three point line. What do, you think Ver- about what do you mean by variable three-point line? I don't know. I read about it. I don't know if it was like Goldsberry was talking about it a long time ago, and then I it might have been a friend of mine whose idea it was, but they were talking about like I think Goldsberry and that what was that book he had? Sprawl I mean, ball. Yeah, yeah. Remember he was talking about like variable three-point lines, so the Warriors could put a three-point line different on their home court. Oh. Than if you would go to and play in Phoenix versus New York. That's interesting. Um. You'd have to set it, what, for the season? Like, you can't change it game to game based on who your opponent I is? Probably, I think you probably have to set it for the season. Um, well, yeah, that's interesting. There I mean, needs to be some new strategy in this game, in my opinion. There does. Because um, coaches don't like it. it Because all the deals are made in the summertime and over Instagram DMs between the guy. I want to see some tactics, some strategy, something different. It's too... Yeah, and some the the game has kind of um, it's people could say it's evolved because of analytics and things like that. And obviously, somebody who's you know full head steam into analytics, I um, mean that side of the game. I think it's almost it's it's harmed the product on the court in a sense because these games kind of just evolve into whoever makes the most threes wins now. But they, all, not, but they all do the same thing because that's the, stra- the, thing. the strategy they, is set. Exactly, because every team, like when the Warriors were doing it seven years ago in 2015, mm-hmm. and they were on the cutting edge of like shooting all these threes and even Maury Ball and stuff like that too, right. it's like they were on the cutting edge. They were doing this while all the other teams were still stuck on like mid-range, right. getting to the basket, like stuff like that. Um, and so it was different. But now all these teams have quote-unquote evolved right. to the same point where now they're it's all threes are at the rim. Right. It's all Mori ball. Right. And so, yeah, I'm interested to see what the next evolution is going to be. Right. Whether it's going to be, like, mandated by, like, a rule change by the league or whether it's going to be become – because some other s- style of play comes about. Yeah. I want to see something different. I want to, I want to throw a little wrench in it, man. I want to throw a little wrench yeah. in it and, get, and change the strategy. So, that was it, man. You got some – you got some fodder for, for future podcasts, man. I mean, I think the next, the, the low hanging fruit kind of thing is the way players are kind of evolving. The next thing is the players under 6'6 six, six are going to become extinct, I think. Yeah. It's just going to be like 6'6, six, 6'7, six, 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 you, you need to talk to Shay. You need to talk to Shay Frazy, man. Because you're seeing some of these short, strong dudes. Be able to control the game in different ways. Like a now. Drew or like a Marcus Smart. Or Drew, yeah, Drew, Marcus Smart, even Grant Williams, obviously taller, but for his position. Yeah. Even like look at Kyle Lowry, you know, he's still, now he's, you know, yeah, he's on the tail end now. Right, but 
that's a big effect. And look at some of these smaller guards. So I think it is actually this is where we got to stop because I got I don't have this is great. I don't have this strong is great. opinions or or knowledge, but I, I kind of hear some of the friends I talk to, right? And I think the game is going through another transformation, right? Away from the six six to six nine lengthy guy because they're being moved in different places around on the court by like this kind of physicality by some of these mm. guys. So anyways, we got I'm going to hook you up with some people to talk to. We got some strategy. Yo, it's time to get some tacos, right. man. We're in LA, man. I got to All right, it. let's do it. All right. Well, <laughs> Mustafa, it's been a pleasure, my guy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a... Uh-oh. Hey, See, we're we're actually working. We're doing a podcast. We're finishing yeah. up the pod right now. We were just talk we were just talking about this you're on this is legit, man. This you're, is legit. I'll you're, call right back. You're on the pod right now. You want to say what's up? <laughs> I, I call you right. I call you right. Now. What's up, young fella? <laughs> oh. All right, guys. Well, until next time, wag that. Oh, I like that. What, what team am I gonna get though? I want some. I need to give me some. We y'all gonna drop some stuff? We'll, we'll get you some stuff. We'll get right, you some cool. stuff. Wag that. I like All that. Right. All right. Wait, thanks, it's an acronym for we are gonna buy a team. Oh, I know it. Oh, okay. I want to buy a team too. Though. Thank you.